Okay. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel and specifically to the Chatamo Movie Hour. We are beginning our, well, we're not beginning, we're on actually the second uh, part of our journey uh, through Bong Joon Ho's um, more recent films. Uh, we just wrapped up Snowpiercer, which will premiere this Saturday. And now we are going to dive into Parasite. So with that, cheers. Uh, let cheers. me go ahead and refill. Get started here. Um, yeah. So cheers. And um, you wanted to announce um, a, a national holiday that we're celebrating as well, Trump. Yes, happy Alien Day, everybody. Uh, on the heels of our massive alien, um, I don't know what you would call it, series that we did. Uh, there's not a word big enough for what we did with that series, but uh, happy Alien Day, everybody. Um, yeah, so great way to kick this one off. The film's called Parasite, Alien Parasite. That's the only connection I got. It's all coming together. It's all meant it to be. Is. Yeah, so uh, obviously Parasite took the world by storm. Um, it swept all of the uh, award shows, including uh, the Oscar for Best Picture, um, obviously directed by Bong Joon-ho. Um, we have just filmed our Snowpiercer deep dive, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. And um, we're, we're deep diving into Parasite now. And I just wanna say, I've seen the movie now three times, maybe four, three or four times, um, you get onion layers peeled back each time, um, which is a testament to him as a director, as a screenwriter, um, because much like Snowpiercer and some of his other films, not only did he direct Parasite, but he's also the screenwriter. Um, so yeah, with that being said, uh, we have a pretty stellar cast. I learned that some of the folks in this um, are pretty much huge A-listers in Korea, including Song Kang-ho, who is the father of the um, uh, Take, the, what's the name of the poor family? Their last name is it the Take family? Oh, Kim, the Kim family? Kim family, thank you. Um, it, I just have their first names. Um, he was also in Snowpiercer, he's brilliant. And the mother uh, in the Count Kim family, excuse me, um, as played by uh, Lee Jung-un, apologize for butchering these names, was also the voice of the uh, pig or boar or whatever it is in Okja. So both of them have a working relationship with Bong. And I learned just fun factoid that um, Song Kang-ho, who plays the father, Kim, um, actually signed on to do the movie blindly. He just said, it's Bong Joon-ho, I'm doing it. Um, they didn't even have a concept or a script. So I thought that was pretty amazing that he put that as, much. As did the guy in Snowpiercer at the, the guy at the end of the train. What's his name? Mr. Um... Ed Harris did the same. Yes. Yes. Yeah, he signed on. I was on. trying to remember his name in the film Snowpiercer. Yeah. Will, Willard? No, or... Okay. Wilford. Wilford, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, so that you get, I've seen that a couple times already, people just like dying to work with this guy. Um, I think you get that a lot when any, any time a director has like such a, a body of work that's singular to that director and they have such a stamp on their films mm -hmm. and they are visionaries in that way. So I just, I think that's really cool. Yeah, I was struck by the, first of all, the movie is a foreign film. Um, so it's already, I think, even in 2020, a little bit of an ask for most Western audiences who have been conditioned to enjoy more popcorn um, or sp at least take the time to spend their money in theaters on more popcorn type movies. Is it a um, foreign film or is it a foreign language film? Foreign language film, excuse me. I, no, I'm, I'm just asking because I'm no, not for no, sure. But... Right. That's an important distinction to make. I think it is a foreign language film, but I, I'm saying all of that to say that, you know, it's subtitled, um, it's right. Korean, not everyone is familiar with Bong Joon-ho, and for an audience to go and spend money in a theater and see this, um, I think it's fantastic, and, and the, um, just the way it really took the West by storm, I think it's just fantastic, because the narrative is universal. It speaks to class, which is also something he's explored in previous movies, specifically Snowpiercer. Um, but I'm, I'm struck by not it only- It is a foreign film. 
film. Okay. Yeah, I, I was a little questioning that because it did win Best Picture at the Oscars, and I thought that the criteria for that was it's the first foreign language film to ever win Best Picture. Best Picture yeah. And so I thought criteria for winning Best Picture at the Oscars was that it was an American film, but apparently I'm definitely wrong. Um, it says it's a South Korean film, so... It's interesting because I wonder then what the, like, why wasn't it just in the foreign language category? I wonder what right. the difference is. Because it's so fucking good. <laughs> they had you. to, like, bu bump it into the category of best picture. I'm here for that. Um, not that other foreign I, films aren't. I'm not saying that. I'm just no, saying. No, 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 in this not. case, they were like, bam. <laughs> But, but the success of this film, to your point, opens doors for foreign language films and foreign films in general to um, get more exposure. They know they can make money. Um, they know people will pay to see it. They know people will, you know, get a Hulu subscription just to watch it, you know, whatever the case may be. But, right. you know, aside from the, the plot and the narrative, which we'll, we'll dive into, I was really struck by... Um, two things. Number one, I didn't know really what to expect when going into this movie. Um, it wasn't heavily marketed, or at least it wasn't marketed um, in a way that really told you what to expect. Um, I went into it thinking I was going to get like some sort of a horror moment, and you right. get a horror moment, but in a very realistic, different way. Um, and then I was also struck by how fucking funny this movie is. It's it's hilarious. Yeah. There are jokes on jokes on jokes. And um, yeah, let me pass it over to you and get some of your initial thoughts. I agree um, completely. Like all, all I heard was like a lot of buzz about it from different sources. And I had seen Okja and The Host, but I wasn't mm -hmm. yet like familiar with him as a director where I was like making the connections. Um, and then of course, like we went back and um, you had me watch Snowpiercer and all that, and I watched Mother and all that. Um, and it's really cool to see his body of work as like, as as an in 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 its entirety, kind of as mm -hmm. a, as a fully connected piece of work. Because um, when I first saw Par Parasite, I didn't know what to expect. I was expecting a little, not like a horror film, but to your point, like that type of a like more suspenseful, a little bit more of like a horror film type film. And that's not what you get at all. Um, but so I was kind of thrown for a loop because I, I didn't know what he was all about and I wasn't sure. But then once, if you see Snowpiercer first, which you did, I saw it after I saw Parasite. I think it sets you up to appreciate Parasite a lot more because you know where he's coming from even more. Um, and definitely the second time or third or whatever that you see Parasite, it's so much more of a rich experience because you kind of know what to look for along the way. And you're, you're spotting things like when um, the uh, Park husband um, comes home from work, the, the wealthy family, when he comes home from work every day, the lights that turn on over him. And they've always made sure, like, all throughout the film, even if it's, like, in the distance or he's not even the main thing in the shot, when he's coming home, those lights are going on and they're going off and you don't pay attention to it at all the first time. So um, you later realize that it's someone, there's a reason for it, which we'll get into. But it's stuff like that that, on the second viewing, is really rewarding. So yeah. I enjoyed it a lot more the second time, now that I knew what I was going in for, I knew him as as an artist more, like where he's coming from, the points he's trying to make. Yeah. He makes a lot of similar points, which is kind of cool. So you, you really get a sense of like what what he believes in as a person through his films. And it's really cool. Um, I wish I would have seen Snowpiercer like when it came out, because I would have been totally set up for, for Parasite. But either way, once I watched Snowpiercer and then rewatched Parasite, you just appreciate it even more on another level because he's like he meditates as an artist on these specific themes yeah. and, and revisits them in different ways. Yes. Um, I have a ridiculous amount of notes for some reason on this film, probably because this is one of the first times where um, like we've done a lot of films that are like alien, like my favorite film. So I don't need, feel like I needed to take notes because it's kind of all right. up there. This yeah. time I like actively took notes. So I just have a lot. But um. 
Uh, you, usually, awesome. you usually have more notes than me. And this time I have a lot of notes. Um, yeah, so um, like I said, when a, when a director has that body of work that draws similar themes, I love that. Because um, you don't have a lot of directors like that now. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote down that it's shocking to some Americans to see people live in absolute poverty in shows or films. Um, but it's actually extremely common. Right. So to us, even to like lower income people in America, that looks like shocking. But right. it's actually more common than how we live in the world. Right. So like, it's just an interesting thing to think of. Uh, therefore, it really shouldn't be that shocking. Um, yeah, because I was thinking about that when watching this film and a couple other things recently. Um, yeah, but... the, the, the whole, you just named something that didn't even really occur to me, but it's, it's a point that I'm glad that you named, which is this Western paradigm that some of us have the privilege of living in is really the exception and not the rule. Like most of the world, lives in the third world um right and, like, like when we uh, talk about being poor in america we're talking about america poor we're not right. talking about like the greater yeah i mean they're poor. Poor. Uh, yeah. what's referred to as a semi-basement it's half subterranean um and it's already on like you know in the lowest sector of the city um, which is, again, um, something that the director did purposefully to really use sets um, and setting to give you the distinction between the classes. But I mean, they're, they're, you know, it's a family of four, mom, dad, brother, sister, who are relatively the same age, or maybe they're twins, I don't know. Um, and, you know, they're stealing Wi-Fi, you know, they're folding pizza boxes. And, yeah, I uh, love when, when they finally get like a little money and they can get their phones reconnected. The father gives praise for this bountiful bounty Wi-Fi, and I love that. that. I have that I in my I can relate. Like, that's great. <laughs> that Would feeling of, like, yeah, getting Wi-Fi back. Yeah, that bounteous Wi-Fi. Yeah, and, you know, the another thing that was funny is, like, they're when they're folding pizza boxes for money, they're watching YouTube videos that went viral a couple of years ago of, like, people that can speed put together pizza boxes. And I just thought that was really, really funny. That's a neat um, moment, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they have, you know, insect infestations in their apartment, you know, it's just, he paints such a um, visceral picture of what it would be like to live right. in that situation. And and I don't know um, if you have anything else you wanna say to I that. I wrote down that while you're in still in their apartment, like toward the beginning of the film, since you're touching on that, and that's kind of what we're talking, there's this great shot of from their vantage point on their living room floor in their small apartment, looking up and out their window. And you can see kind of like from this um, certain angle where you can see kind of out, but also up. And mm -hmm. you see this like blanket of um, telephone wires over the alley, like in front of their, or the street in front of their house. Um, and then later on in the film, you see it from the opposite angle. You see like down through them, which yeah. is so interesting. And it's so interesting. I think you're probably gonna touch on this too, but how he plays with levels and how he plays with class as like, you know, the upper class, the lower class, but physically having the lower class family be like so low and have to go down so many stairways and they're just going down endless, um, elevation downward into where they live so they're physically lower and then even the family in the house is several stair uh staircases um sets of stairs lower right. under that actual house so right. that's really interesting and then with that rectangle window that they look out of their apartment there's mm -hmm. another scene later where they're looking out of the huge window in the fancy house um, and it's also a rectangle, but it's so much bigger, lets so much more light in, and it has a gorgeous view of, of plant life, which is the opposite of like cities and telephone wires. Right. So, uh, it's very, I love how he juxtaposed, juxtaposes different things right next to each other so you can see it. And he makes that like super clear. I love that he does that as a director.
it's when you watch the movie for the first time, you're you're picking up on these things almost subconsciously. I mean, you're aware of them, but you're not paying attention to them. It's like, okay, they're poor, they're rich. But like when you give it a rewatch and you see, you know, you know, the ascent and the descent, um, the use of stairs, the use of the windows, which I want to talk about in a little bit more detail. But, you know, yeah, to your point about like the t- when when they're looking out of their window, the poor, right. the, the poor family, they look up a street that goes up because they are literally at the bottom and they, right. they keep having this dumb drunk guy come and piss by their window, which is just like yes. one more slap in the face, but it's funny. Um, and then, you know, they have to c- literally climb out of their house just to get to the ground floor. And then they have to physically climb steps, you know, to get to right. the city where the family lives. And the family, it's the opposite. You know, when you go, when you first see the um, brother of the Kim family, um, uh, what is his name? His name is um, Dong, no, no, that's the husband. Uh, sorry, Ki Wu, the, the son of the Kim family. He's the first one to gain entrance into the uh, the rich family's house. Right. Um, as they're, you know, working their way and scheming into um taking advantage of this rich family, he has to ascend a flight of stairs just to get to their front door. Right. And it's, and as opposed to telephone wires and squalor, it's just surrounded yeah. by greenery. And then there's stairs in their house because it's a multi-level home. Right. It's just- They're down it, to the basement of their-, their Right. Um, I, maybe the previous owner was like, or the architect, was like a doomsday prepper because there's that whole thing <laughs> underneath the fan, uh, the underneath the um there's a basement like a traditional basement where you can store food and stuff and then unbeknownst to the current um park family that lives there there's this like bunker even several flights below that basement i and learned it's so it's so great when um like cinematography and all that plays such a part in like bringing home all these like examples that the film itself and the screenplay is trying to get across and you don't see cinematography used that way right now so that makes this film special thank you for saying that and that reminds me of our alien series specifically when we discussed your favorite movie alien and the importance of how the ship itself was a character cinematography Right. And direction was used to literally and a device to like second. keep them um, like cut off from everything and also contained and yes. claustrophobic. Yeah. yeah. I think Bong Jun Ho, having seen Snowpiercer and Parasite, his use, he, he's a he's masterful, much like Ridley Scott was with Alien, in terms of turning the set into a character. Those right. both of those homes are characters yeah. in the movie and I learned today you had sent me some behind the scenes stuff to look at that um both the park uh uh what's the rich family's last name park okay sorry I keep getting it mixed up both the rich park home and the entire set including the street that the Kim family lives on were built those are set that blew my mind yes and that was I think obviously, so they could really control the set being of service to the screenplay. So yeah. so you have a director that's balancing um, cinematography, sets, story, and filmmaking, uh, you know, under, under the umbrella of filmmaking, like balancing those things so well, where you usually don't have that kind of harmony. Oh, I mean, right. it takes a lot of skill, so definitely. Yeah. And I and care, care, attention to detail. Yeah. Yeah. Real, real care, real, like clearly to your earlier point, like he has themes that are important to him um, that he keeps exploring in vastly different ways. You know, I saw Snowpiercer before this, you had the other experience and you had mentioned earlier that you wish you had maybe seen Snowpiercer first because it would have better prepared you for this. But and, 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 and in a lot of ways, I think that's true, but also like having seen Snowpiercer before Parasite, I was not prepared for what I was getting, you know, in terms of what like thematically, yes, but like in terms of like the way he was, the type of story he was telling, he went from something so fantastical to something so grounded in reality. It was such a 
of 180, but it was essentially telling us the, the same story. Right. You know, in terms of class, yeah. Yeah. But and I, I wanted to. I was kind of shocked about that because I'm more used to films um, not being that way, but this director clearly has a specific voice. Yeah. I wanted to ask if uh, you had picked up on this or, or had uh, read about it in your research or in your notes, but going back to the windows for a second, um, I found a YouTube video that goes into some detail about this, the direction of cinematography, specifically that um, Bong Joon-ho used a 2.39 to 1 aspect ratio when, at least when shooting out of the windows. So he designed it such that the audience, when the Kim family is looking out of their window, out of their basement, and when the Park family looks out of their huge portrait window that's basically the size of the entire wall yeah the audience is seeing it like in the same way that the characters would be like you're literally looking out of the window like you were physically there right. um and he where is it that i wrote this he said that he used um he wanted the window of the kim family the poor family to have a sense of hope and fear like they have just enough of a glimpse of mm. the out world and hope and this potentiality of like ascending out of their class but right. it's also obscured by their class and to me that right. was just that's pure the ultimate like, torture i mean we're living the american dream <laughs> but so at first you wonder when you're watching this like why aren't they doing better because they're they're actually um the kim family is so intelligent and so clever and hardworking and all those attributes that are usually rewarded in a society, but they're not moving up. And I think it just further illustrates how difficult it is to move up and how things, there's there's things that are deliberately put in place to prevent people from switching classes. Absolutely. And there's a really good line, and this is a small sidebar, but the new show that's on Hulu, Little File Fires Everywhere with Reese Witherspoon and Carrie Washington also explores class and race. Um, it's based by a book by Celeste Ng. And there's a line in it where Carrie Washington's character, who is a woman of color, is talking to Reese's character, who's a upper middle class white woman. And she says, you didn't have, or excuse me, she says, you didn't make good choices, you had good choices. And I think that that is just a reminder for all of us is that there is no such thing as quality, you know, at best we could hope for equanimity. And I think to your point, like you have this family, the Kim family who's living in squalor, but they joke, they love each other. They're for all intents and purposes, quite happy, maybe not with their circumstances, but they're happy people. Um, as opposed to the Park family who are completely disconnected from each other. Um, they're the yeah. husband, never actually admits to loving his wife when asked. Um, so you have just more right. of a, a, a facade of a, like a partnership and a marriage playing out versus a family that really loves each other and is so smart well, and clever. I was wondering play. a lot about that because um, the Kim father presses the park, hus the Kim husband presses the park husband on that point twice in the film. Yes for some reason, once in a car late at night when they're driving, and then once at the son's birthday party toward the end of the film when they have the Native American headdresses on, yes. and they're about to, like, play Indians for the son. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, why is um, the Kim father, um, why is that such a, uh, why, why is he so curious about that? But if you really look, I mean, there are, they might not have the kind of closeness that the the Kim family has, the Park family might not, but right. like physical closeness, but they there is does seem to be a lot of love there too. I mean, yeah, the I, way I, they go at it on the couch, the way they have um, <laughs> sort of close conversations about their family, where they're talking as equals, like when they're talking about the panties that are left in the car, he does That's seem to treat her as like an equal in that conversation. So there does seem to be like um, a, a fairly healthy family unit. I, I, I think it'd be hard to say, but it does feel like the Kim family 
are closer, but you just wonder if that's just like circumstantial. That's I mean, a good I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the Park family, I mean, they definitely love their children for sure. I mean, they dote on their children and spoil the son and the daughter. Yeah. Um, don't get me started on the Native American appropriation. I don't, it's, it's so though. Um, well, but, yeah. but yeah, it goes back to like the 50s in this country when, ev or, you know, 50s through, I guess, right. maybe 90s when kids would play like cowboys and Indians. Right. So it's that kind of thing. And yeah. for sure. And so but culture and and there's obviously fascination with cowboys it's, and indians it's I think innocent it's offensive when americans do it because yeah. of our history but, but it's, it's also like, pretty offensive and funny when the dad puts on the headdress at the end at the party and gets spoiler yes. alert murdered in it i mean it's it's and, just and then and tells the other tells the other um the park husband tells kim husband you know you're yeah. getting paid for this <laughs> Right, like just like, shut don't up. forget, you're getting Dude. paid extra for this. Yeah. So, yeah, anyway. you're right. He does speak to his wife. Um, the park husband does speak to his wife as an equal, and there does seem to be like a, a partnership there for sure. But it's there, there's definitely like not like the sex scene on the couch is fucking hilarious, and <laughs> there's some romance there. But when, what I mean by like they, I'm not suggesting they don't love each other as much. I guess what I mean is like it's more of like, there's more distance there. You know, the husband is the breadwinner. He's out all day. Right. He, I just wonder what, what Bong Joon-ho is trying to get us to understand by having the lower class dad ask the upper class dad twice about that in the film and never get like a direct answer. Right. You know what I mean? There's something That's, there. but I mean, the, the way I read it was just how I read people that I know that are of that level of you know class in my life and how they're just betrayed you know around you and media right. or whatever but the people that I've done personally like that's when There's you're when you definitely have that. social dif dis, uh, differences yes yeah. it's just like the, the the roles are much more traditionally fixed husband does x wife does y right you know because wife gets to live the, the life that she wants and get all the nice things. So there's just, and, and husband right. gets to go off and do his, you know, uh, nondescript activities. I think that's just the case. I, I Like, for, like you uh, have the Kim family has to all kind of like work together to survive, to, right? Yeah. They have to, to, I to survive, yeah. I only wanted to say one more thing about the windows and then I'm, I'm gonna stop talking about them, but, I just learned about this because of some of the behind the scenes interviews that you sent me um, that Bong Joon-ho also, when it comes to the Park and Kim family, um, not just the windows, but the way he shoots the film, which again, I need I need to rewatch it now knowing this, when he shoots it in, I, what is, and you might be familiar with this, in a 180 fashion, meaning when he shoots the Kim family, the poor family, he shoots them on, and I'm going to maybe not get the left or right accurate, but let's just say for argument's sake, he shoots the Kim family, they're always in the left-hand side of the frame. Right. Whereas when he shoots the Park family, the, the action is going on on the right-hand side of the frame such that it gives this sub subliminal notion of the, the two houses almost facing each other and like, like neighbors on opposite sides of the street. And um, he apparently did the same thing in Snowpiercer. When you're looking at the um, back of the train, which is the poor people, he does the same thing. The, the shot, everyone is framed on the left, whereas the farther you get to the front of the train with the one percenters, everything is framed on the right. Mm. So That's interesting. It, it's not um, something I noticed, but I thought that was just fascinating. Something I know um, about film is that when you're doing what, what are called like over the shoulder shots, when you're shooting behind one person, you shoot over, um, like say their right shoulder at the person they're talking to. And then when you have the reverse shot, it has to be over the other person's left shoulder. Sure. And if it wasn't, if it was over the same shoulder, you would just get this bizarre, like I've seen them demonstrate it, but it's like really bizarre. You're expecting it to like look one way 
all of a sudden you don't realize that you're facing the other way. And it's just this weird thing. Make it look like a mirror at that point, right? I guess so. I guess so. It's just like a trick of the mind too. Like if you see it done wrong, you notice it right away. And sometimes like in a, in a like super amateur film, maybe you'll see like shots like that and you won't know what's wrong, but something's really wrong because whenever you're having a conversation, you always have to alternate the shoulder that you're filming over to the other person. Right, right, right. No, totally. But Um, there may have been some like conscious um, doubling down on that type of like keeping them separate. You know what I mean? I didn't notice that, but that's interesting. It's it's one more reason to waste another two hours of my life. Um, (laughs) I I wrote that the sister is very cool, like like (laughs) she's from the film Hackers in the 90s. (laughs) Like, she's you know how she's amazing. doing, like, the Photoshop, and she's, like, at the computer, like, she's, like, she's definitely, like, uber cool, like, yeah. in that hacker's kind of way. Yeah, she's fantastic, and she's also hilarious in the movie, especially when she gets her entree into the park house as the tour of the younger Native American-obsessed son, and she basically, like, just cons the simple mom as she's referred to the park mom yeah. um and like, co- like convincing her that her son is like a savant and when she's showing uh she's analyzing one of his just absurd child portraits she's like oh no this is the bottom yeah. right this is the zone like your son is this like she's just her delivery is this movie is we've talked about this on many other chatting on movie hours we love when a movie is funny without trying to be funny, and this movie is that. Yeah, the sister later says, oh, I just Googled art therapy and right. winged the rest, and suddenly the mother's in tears. It's brilliant. <laughs> I mean, it made brilliant. me think of, like, in, in our culture, that's very true of many, like, real-life professions of people that are sort of winging it a little bit, and what comes to mind are, like, psychics and mediums, maybe not all of them, but certainly, in my opinion... Right. All of them, but you know, a lot of professions fine. that aren't strictly science and degree based that right. are more spiritual, are more objective, and it's just like there's a lot of wiggle room there for people to take advantage of other people, oh, and yeah. that's kind of what it reminded me of. Um, yeah, which is so funny because you know who knows um, who you might hire as a contractor or like a um, an advisor or like a spiritual advisor. It could right. totally be just be full of shit like this girl was. Right. It's, it demonstrates how easy that is to kind of like yeah. just do a quick Google search and take advantage of someone, which I think there's a lot of truth in that. We want to believe what we what serves us. And definitely we look for things that reinforce what we already believe. And, they, wanted... and we tend to weed out and ignore the stuff that doesn't reinforce what we believe. Absolutely. Absolutely. I That's mean, not fun. you and me, but. No, I mean, we're woke AF. <laughs> um, I put, I put, um, so I have some criticisms too, but, um, so I put that like, um, in terms of the color and the staging and the lighting, like you have some shots in the poor area of town that the Kim family live in that mm-hmm. are actually like very clean and beautiful looking. And you have like a lot of, um, highlights of like red and blue and just like, um, some pretty smoke in the background. Everything's like super like hyper stylized, which yeah. I think is not like really accurate to living in that type of a situation. So I'm wondering why those parts are so stylized and controlled that way. And then you have some other shots like when everyone is um, misplaced in that gymnasium where it does look more documentarian and stark and like depressing. A lot to to me, which is more like realistic of living in those conditions sometimes. And not to say that they're like living in, um, you know, a depression just because they're poor. But that area of town is just not like beautiful in that way. So it's just interesting that the cinematography even made some of those shots look so like romanticized. Yeah, I mean, the... Aesthetically pleasing to the eye, I don't know. I mean, it just to keep to 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 give the weight of that environ the the same weight that something beautiful, traditionally beautiful, like right. 
the park house or you know the my, upper my, echelon i don't know yeah my thought was that if it was more like stark and gritty we could sink our teeth into their everyday like struggle more a little bit more because that's what even though i'm sure they have a lot of joy in their lives as well the part that we're focused on is the contrast right between park and them so like yeah um, sure. it's just interesting i don't know it's just something i noticed but i just i need to take a moment again because every time your head turns ever slightly your contour is so on point and i know you're not wearing makeup but just like where your five o'clock shadow meets your delicious it's like i had to paint mine on and you're just like serving me contour so anyway bless you well, bless i just you. Sh i just shaved for this interview so thank you we appreciate uh, it yes um did you have anything else on the criticism front? Because I wanted to talk I a do. little bit. Oh, hit us. That's the truth. I do. So, um, okay, should I? I'll go through kind of all that to get it out of the way because this this film is a brilliant work of art. So I want to kind of discuss like the things that were like seemed off to me, and it's sure. not to say these things are wrong in any way because I think that this film is so like exemplary of yeah brilliant filmmaking that it's not like a slight to the film it's just like some things I noticed that I kind of wanted to get your opinion on too um yeah. so um let me see here hold on um at the beginning of the film you see you take them as more earnest and honest the Kim mm -hmm. family um even there's a scene where the son justifies printing out the fake college paper to get the job with the Park family by saying, oh, well, I'm going to attend this school. So it's not totally untrue. Um, right. But that <laughs> belies like the con artists that they become in a way. And there's, mm -hmm. it seems to be like a little bit of an inconsistency there. Like you don't see them becoming like so, so like, uh, I don't know, becoming this like con collective. You don't really like see that happening right. in the beginning of the film. I don't know. And uh I just think that there's, um, let me see, how did I, I feel like the mother of the um, Park family is like exceptionally easy to manipulate. And oh, yeah. obviously, even how simple. if you notice, every single thing goes perfectly for the Kim family. Like every single person that they want to oust is ousted immediately. Every single thing That's that they... Perfect there's so many close calls, they always get away with it. And it's just kind of like, this is so unrealistic. Um, so part of me right. was like wondering about, about that. I, I didn't even think about that, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the only explanation I have for that is just, it's the MacGuffins moving the narrative forward. I mean, it's, right. it's just getting us to the, the juicy, you know, right. chocolatey center, which is them, infiltrating and being the parasites and then right. asking of the old getting them in there right right but I put so I wrote that everything was a little too perfect that like um the father happened to be like the perfect driver that they needed to fill that spot right. and and that's exactly what the Park family needed and wanted and they're so easy to manipulate into it the sister was the perfect manipulator at art theory the son was the perfect tutor for the daughter um, right. The Park family was easy to manipulate and everything in every way, making it just like, um, but when I watched it the second time, so when I watched it the first time, I got a little hung up on some of those things. And then when sure. I watched it the second time, you're watching with a macro view where you're like zoomed out and you're looking yeah. at more like the social themes, which is really what's important anyway in this film, not those things that I mentioned. Um, right. So with, which he's doing so skillfully, so... Yeah, but when something is is catching your eye enough that it it takes you out of the movie in any capacity, I mean that's a worthy criticism, you know. And I think some of it is done almost out of humor because it makes you smile or laugh. Like the the scene when they're coming home from camping, um, there's no way that family would have got their shit together in like a minute flat. Like <laughs> not only did they cook the full meal, but like the that place was like a shithole with like the mess they had made. There was broken glass everywhere. And I right. mean like, and then when like, um, you know, they're in this huge fight with this other family from below the stairs and the, the other, the woman from below the stairs is like stomping up the stairs and the, 
the park wife is just casually walking by as the Kim wife like kicks her down the stairs and she like rolls this heavy body rolls down the stairs. The park wife is none the wiser. Like that oh, yeah. just would not happen. That's totally yeah. unrealistic. But it's funny and so I think it's stylized maybe, but it did like throw me for a loop because they're so invested in it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I would have to chalk it up to just it being stylized because to your point, it's it's not realistic in, in any way, shape, or form. Um, right. But it moves the narrative forward. And um, I wonder what about the film or about me wants it wants to take it so seriously. You know what I mean? Whereas I think Bong Joon Ho is maybe more playful as, as an artist. That's a really excellent question. I uh, I think because. I, if I may, I think because uh, you've watched it more than once and, and for anyone that's watched it more than once and it's really dissecting what he's trying to accomplish. Right. I don't think, I don't, I don't know if you felt that way. Did you feel that way on the initial uh, viewing too, where it was like, this ain't real. Yeah, that's really? where I felt okay. it the strongest. It was the okay. first time I watched it. For me, it was a little bit of the opposite. Like I was a little, like I wasn't paying attention as much to stuff like that as I was to like, what, you know, what the hell is going on? The but when I would things. watch it, yeah, those things came more to the fore, but that's a really good question. You know, what is it that makes you want it to be grittier and more realistic? I think, you know, if I'm to ask myself that same question, it's very simply like, He's trying to tell a very realistic story. I, well, let me articulate that. He's dealing with heady subject Think. matter in terms of yeah. class structure, for sure. The, the story itself is not in itself entirely realistic, but it's still based in reality. It's not taking place on a train, you know, in the apocalyptic future. future right. And you want it to maybe hit home more. You want it to be more realistic because he's the theme thematically it's so heady. I, I right. that's would be my I think you're you hit it right on the head. Um I I I tried to dissect it more on the second view and I made a note um that even though I feel that the park wife is is so naive, it almost mm -hmm. highlights what a bubble her and her family live in that's protected yeah. from a lot of reality of social economics and just the, right. the harsh reality that a lot of other people are like slapped in the face with every day on the street. They're, they're kind of um, secluded and protected from by wealth and gates and property and all those kind yeah. of things and I mean, class. They're insulated and I think that's right. what happens when you get. So she's half... living in a bubble more than just being stupid. She's she's right. she's naive in on different levels yeah and I think it's this is where it gets tricky for me when because it's very easy to not only be envious of but resent resentful and downright hate people that are at the very 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 tippity top right and, and the for the most, <laughs> exactly and and for the most part we should want to eat the rich you know it is it yeah, is I, all suffering, I'm just no, but I mean, it's, that's, uh, truer words have never been spoken, you know, eat the rich is, you know, the mantra for everyone who has gone without, but millions of people to your point, though, you know, there are people that are, have worked their way from the bottom to the top. Do we shit on them? And there are people that are born into it and it's not their fault that they're rich. Do we shit on them? And it's also, you know. And there's different know, societies where there's different degrees of it being difficult to do those things as well. Like, well, yeah. this is set in Korea and it seems more difficult to move up there from what I'm seeing in this particular story, in this sure. particular area for these particular people than it is maybe in the U.S. Although I think it's extremely I think something a lot of people overlook is like the the car the cards you're dealt right play such a significant part where you're born um, your support network your family all those one ups that people get in our society make way more of a difference than I feel like I hear people talking about a lot. Oh yeah, well because in America we're sold the notion that the the American dream is accessible to everyone anyone can be right. president. 
anything. It's a lie. Right. And, you know, like our president would like you to believe that, you know, he tirelessly worked his way up to the top for what he has, when in reality, he was given like a substantial million, loan and came from wealthy fam a wealthy family. And, you know, there's and a lot of other factors. Yeah. Yeah. And it harkens back to that quote from Little Fires Everywhere, where she says, you didn't make good choices, you had good choices. Exactly. And the idea that the park wife is naive, it's like, it to me, you know, there's there's willful, willful ignorance, which is like the worst kind of disease. There's ignorance. And then there's, you don't know what you don't know. And I, it, it's really hard for me to fault somebody for not knowing what they don't know, because all of us, to, right. to whatever degree we're discussing, don't know what we don't know. You know what I mean? So Right. Well, it's almost have, like the, the uber rich kind of keep the lower class at arm's length by saying, look how great everything is for me, like work really hard and you can have it too. And you're being sold that American dream. And it's just um, sometimes not possible for people, depending right. on a lot of factors. So yeah, it's a, it's an illusion, really. Um, I wanted to talk about the scholar stone for a second, which is pretty much one of the yeah. things that makes this like manifest the plot of this movie which is you have the son of the kim family meeting with his more well-to-do friend um ming who gifts the family a scholar stone which in korean is called a gongshi um or that might also be the japanese name but it's basically a stone they can range from less than a pound to thousands of pounds but historically, they've just been aesthetically pleasing, naturally occurring rocks that the scholarly classes would collect and display. And so they're given as gifts, you know, in, in um, certain Asian cultures. And in giving, in Ming, this kind of just happenstance thing, Ming happens to gift this stone to the Kim family, which is supposed to bring material wealth. It, it follows them up and through the, end of the film. And there, there's a, 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 a moment, which I didn't realize until I watched the behind the scenes video you shared with me. At the end of the movie, when, and we can get into the people living in the basement, absolutely, but there's a point in this fight at the end of the movie where the Kim family is fighting with the people living in the basement who, were basically the earlier versions of them, right? Trying to do the same thing. And they're fighting to both be the parasites of the park right. house. And, and, and initially when they first meet them, they, they're higher on the totem pole. Even even yeah. going back to their, their low income apartment they have is just so, yeah. much, is so much nicer than the conditions they're living in, in that bunker right. where they're not even yeah. practically allowed out. So it's almost yeah. like, you feel bad for this low class family that doesn't have a lot of means. And then it's like a whole nother yeah. level. And then that, that family is saying like, Hey, we have, we should have a kinship, you know, we're working people and we're on the same end of the class structure. Like let's work together. And then you have the Kim mom saying, hell no. <laughs> and it's funny yeah, how quickly she abandons her. And I think that maybe Bong Joon-ho is making a point about people in similar situations who are struggling in a class system, not sticking together and not coming together in a way that really is positive and makes change. And you could look at that with politics, you could look at that just with neighbors. There's so many different ways to like think of that, but it was like really interesting. I'm so glad you brought that up because you have, it's yet another layer to this movie. I mean, you, you have the Kim family as the parasite infiltrating this rich family's home so that they can live some semblance of the good life and, and by doing so um, pull themselves out of poverty only to discover that the, uh, the maid or the housekeeper, the house manager, whatever, that's already there did the exact same thing with her husband and he's been living in this bunker, this secret thing right. under the basement well, the she, yeah. yeah, and he's crazy slash. So they're, they're like the ultimate extreme of uh, being oppressed by society 
um, yeah. you know, how hard it is to just get by for some people. But the fact that they are literally, they both, both families, the, the couple that was already there and the Kim family are essentially trying to do the same thing. They're coming out of the same circumstances. And even they, to your point, can't get on the same page and it ends right. in, in death. I think it speaks to the fact that like, everyone is out for he, the director is trying to say like everybody's out for themselves and like even yeah. and I your, thought about I thought about that a lot I was thinking about like how in in many cases um extreme extremely wealthy people um work together for their self-interest a lot better than extremely impoverished people um but maybe I don't know but uh, I was just thinking that and it's just that's a really interesting distinction of hey we should be lifting each other up not tearing each other down but with all the hardship it's it's difficult but absolutely yeah i mean it's easier to pull together when you have resources versus when like the Koch everybody... brothers who are you know <laughs> using right. a lot of their income to change things to benefit them right and, and power to... that you know no no one who's impoverished has so Stuff right. Like that. If you're if you're you know literally fighting over scraps, there's not really a lot of opportunity for um, empathy and friendship and you know resource consolidation and like let's help each other out. And right. even everything's they more it, difficult. Like everything gets more difficult. They there's I forget who in the movie says it, but there I think it's somebody in the Kim family. It must be. They're referring to the the maid who is quasi living in the bunker with her husband. She's, um, you know, the one that they're trying to now oust and 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 usurp. They say of her, quote, she may look like a sheep, but she acts like a, a fox. Um, you know, because she was there even before the Park family was there. She right. was there with the original owner, the fancy architect yeah. or whatever. And then, you know, somebody else, I think so, it's... The so she's someone that's that's rewarding on a repeat viewing because now you have the knowledge that there's so much more beyond the surface to her character who initially looks like a throwaway character. Exactly. And, you know, the Kim family, I think it's the mom at one point says, quote, money is an iron. It might be the dad. But they're they're making the, the analogy um, or they're making the point rather that, like, things are easier for the rich because money irons out your problems. Cause they, they were commenting on like how the Park family is so nice and sweet um, and they don't have any resentments. And maybe it was the father, maybe it was uh, the Kim father. He says money is an iron. I just thought that was a really mm -hmm. beautiful way of, of putting it. Um, and then you, you know, you get into like the, the, the introduction of odor and smell into this movie yes. and how I, went, uh, I had that at the very end of my notes. Okay, um, do you want to talk about that now or hold off? Well, I'm, you're already way further in the film than my notes, which is fine. Take um, me back. Back, tell me back. Well, so um, kind of where you are, I'm jumping ahead in my notes a little, but the dad of the Kim family mentions that there were a series of businesses that, that he worked for that um, yeah. went, uh, went bust, I think is how he says it. And it's not entirely clear what happened, but it's interesting because when they're eavesdropping on the family that lives in the bunker, the, the husband and wife, the husband says he worked for um, a cake shop in Taiwan that, that the Kim dad earlier said that he worked for that went bust. That's right. I so there's about this that. weird connection that further um, emphasizes that they're really not that different. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so just, I thought that was interesting. Um, I totally forgot about that. Uh, I just have that the sister's exceptionally gifted at manipulating. <laughs> I don't, I just, yes, I like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, oh there's, I, okay. So, here, so you know the scene where, um, go ahead. <laughs> well, when, when they're, when the sister is photoshopping her credentials to be the tutor for the Park family, yeah. her mom. Her mom even says if she wanted, she'd be a fucking great artist, you know? Right, like, it's it just makes you wonder why they're not already, but, like, it comes down to class and, yep. and to this, the class system. But, yeah, you see, you definitely you see the potential for them everywhere. 
in terms Everyone. of their, them being so <laughs> clever and talented. Right. Um, oh, for the underwear that gets planted in the car to get rid of yep. the driver so the dad can, the Kim dad can become the driver. Um, mm -hmm. It makes you wonder because the underwear was planted directly after he gave the Kim daughter a ride home. Right. So the Kim daughter is now going to tutor the the Park Park family's youngest son. Right. But they don't blame her as as being the one that had sex in the car with the driver. They never question yeah. her. They talk to her about it, but they never suspect question her as being someone that had sex with the driver. And they I blame was like, her. yeah. What if it? What if? What if this person that you don't even know that you're just about to hire. Is but this long term person that you already hired, you're just you know what I mean? I don't know. I think it speaks to the night the naivete of the Park family and yeah. and also the younger daughter. The it's daughter just funny how they never they never blame her because oftentimes women do get blamed in situations like that yeah. when there's there's yeah. sexual situations they are you know accused of being you know promiscuous or whatever or shamed for that especially in more conservative cultures like Asian cultures. So oh, yeah. women are usually I, looked down upon for stuff like that. So, but I, I guess they just don't that suspect that it. Like yeah, forward. yeah I, I guess they, it's just something I was like, well, why don't they think? Cause she's the last person he drove. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, it's just, I think because she's also done such a good job at like, manipulating the mom and like right. helping the her son like she's already got her hooks in that they're like they don't right. they wouldn't believe it was her yeah they just think he picked up someone or whatever yeah what else what else i, ha um, I have other notes i could get into go 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 i'm ready for um, you now uh so the second time you watch is, uh, like I said, this is when you really enjoy the details, like the lights over the stairs. Um, now we know that the guy who lives in the bunker is the one turning them on and off with his head. Um, when the Kim family looks out there, oh wait, I, I have that. I covered that. I'm sorry. Um, okay, why, why, he, why is the guy living in the bunker manipulating the lights though? Right. Right, and, and how he says respect, and then when he's killed by the park husband, he literally shouts respect as a sign of respect towards him. It's like so bizarre, fascinating, interesting, and cool. Just I like, agree. Yeah, yeah. When you when you realize that the the maid husband who full time lives in the bunker like doesn't come out at all except maybe to sneak food out of the fridge or when the family's gone like. He's that shit crazy. Oh, and for like, uh, not for the word, back to it, apparently he's like super famous actor in Korea. And like the fact that he was in this movie and had like that small part, like people went crazy for it. But um, he's obsessed with the park father because he is this, you know, titan of industry and he has everything that he doesn't have. So he always just, like to your point, shouts respect and he has. He's right. trying to communicate with him via the lamps and the lighting through Morse code and let right. him know like something. Maybe he's just spelling out respect. I can't remember. But then at the end, when he gets murdered, the fact that he is getting murdered by the person he respects and says out loud, right. respect, he's, he's, yeah. That's, I love I, it. That's, he's so that's, far that's, removed from him that he's like a god to him. Like he looks on him like a god, like he's he's the master, right? Yes. And, and that speaks to the programming of the the poor that even when you're literally getting killed by the one percent, you still are the president your place and show your respect. It means right. Bong Joon Ho is a genius. I'm yes, sorry. He is. And the same can apply to a president that is really bad for the people that voted for him, which I think is happening now. And yeah. um, right. they're in many cases oblivious to it, you know, and they're the ones getting hurt the most. Um, yeah. Like they, they say that COVID-19 is now finally reaching the rural areas and like the flyover states, which are 
which is called, you know, Trump country. So um, that's terrible, but it's like, it's just interesting. But I had a note um, that it's, I thought it was really fucked up and sad when the Kim mother is so mean to the old housekeeper when she comes back and goes down into the bunker for her husband. The old housekeeper, when she's trying to appeal to her and make a case to her, you know, to help each other out. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought like, it was crazy. Like, and you have the Kim family as r the real stars of the film. They're kind of like the yep. ultimate anti-heroes, right? They're the, the anti-hero because you're rooting for them and you're you're invested in them, but they're, you know, conning people, but you give them a pass because of the situation they're in. But then they're incredibly, they, they turn incredibly mean to someone else in a similar position that they're, that they're in that needs help. Yeah. I think it, yeah, I think it's just echoing, or not even echoing, I think he's shouting at us, like, how much, how easy we lose our empathy and how easy it is to other somebody else, even if they're in the same circumstances, if everybody is right. out to protect the other. their own. Okay, so I wanted to get your thoughts about peaches as the forbidden fruit and how they're weaponized in are this. They? So are, are they, they historically considered forbidden or just no, in the I house? think just in the text of this narrative, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I just thought it was a good plot device and like how they did it was like so coordinated. It showed like how well they work together as a family because it was elaborate, right? You have the, the father who's the driver getting the photo of her somewhere and then, mm -hmm. you know, planning the blood on the tissue after she coughs. And then, um, yeah, just the, the, the son, the son and daughter both planted, um, I think they both sprinkled peach on her, right? At different times. And then yeah. of course, when they get really angry at her, when they're all fighting, the one grabs the bag of peaches from the fridge and it's like rubbing it all over her. It's so cruel. And it's so funny, especially, yeah. you know, you just mentioned like the Kim father has to do this like elaborate like scheme to to con, to get to, you know, weaponizing the peach. Like he goes to like, he follows her to the doctor and then he tells yeah. the park, I'm like, oh, I was just taking a selfie for my wife and I happened to catch her in the back. I mean, it's just hilarious <laughs> and unbelievable. Yeah. And then the blood that they squirt into the trash can is hot sauce. I mean, it's just, it's yeah. absurd, it's <laughs> hilarious. And it's just, again, to your earlier yeah. point, like there's so much in this movie that's not believable, but it's, it's right. just. And I'm fucking... wondering if, I'm wondering if um, I was more schooled in like Korean cinema that maybe some of this is more par for the course to, to stylize mm -hmm. things in a way that favors hu humor over realism. Do you know what I mean? So it's oh, yeah. kind of like a little bit um, maybe lost in translation from the Koreans that I've seen Korean cinema that really takes itself super seriously too. So I think yeah. it's kind of all over the place, just like anywhere. But um, uh, definitely, definitely, I think uh, it's it's unusual <laughs> a little bit, but it also feels like uh, a Hollywood movie too, which, which is weird. I mean, it certainly not, had a, not in a bad way, like in a no, know, but I mean, here and there. it has a substantial budget. We're not talking about some small foreign language film, like it had a budget. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, I mean, for fuck's sake, he built both sets from scratch. Yeah. Um, but also, like you know, this notion of peach, like the fruit itself being not forbidden fruit necessarily well forbidden fruit in the sense that it was weaponized but also forbidden fruit in the sense that like how much does a peach cost could the kim family afford peaches on their own like is the peach itself like right. a symbol for something that's out of reach you know because yeah. Yeah. you see um the gentleman the maid's husband that lives in the bunker you know he comes out and and there's even a great line in the movie or maybe it's it's not him, it's Kim. Spoiler alert at the end, when Kim ends up living in the, uh, the Kim father ends up living in the bunker and he's sneaking into the kitchen to get food. He says something like, um, cause there's a new family living there after everybody kills everybody. It's a German family and he makes right. this great, oh my God, Germans eat more than pretzels or beer or something. The sour, um, uh, or so I forget uh, what, sour. He, what the, Sauerkraut, 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 that's what it is. 
Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Or is it like, yeah. Anyway, I think it's but yeah, rough. that's funny. But you get the point. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I, it's like, I like the way he plays with culture and um, race and language, like in all his films. They feel, they feel like worldly films. They don't feel beholden to just like, oh, this is a Korean film that's going to be boxed into being only a Korean film, or this is a Hollywood film that's only going to be like catering to um, English speaking audiences or whatever, even though, you know, Hollywood films now make a lot of money overseas. But right. um, just stylistically, it's like, I, I love how he casts his films. Yeah. Do you want to talk about smell? Well, I have one more note before that or, okay. or no, after that. No, talk, talk to me about smell. Um, so or, we're talking about yeah. juxtaposition, uh, his skill in that as a director. Um, for example, when the park wife is taking her clothes out in her enormous walk-in closet, and then mm -hmm. we cut to the high school gymnasium where hundreds of the poor have been misplaced and are going through, rummaging through whatever used clothes just to have something to wear and they're picking out their clothes in that fashion. So you have this direct comparison and I love direct comparisons like that. Um, yeah. But he, Bong Joon-ho does them really well, I think. And- not, um, They don't feel forced on your throat. Right, they don't, but um, they're gratifying when you see them. Um, it forces the viewer to see things very clearly and the difference between the classes in a way that some factory farm videos expose like animal conditions but people who right. eat meat don't want to see it because they know it's happening but it ruins the experience of eating meat for them right they'll so, have to reconcile their in, own decisions right their own in, right not to go down the vegan rabbit hole but Bong Jun ho i believe is vegan and he made that yeah. film akja about factory farming and um the global impact and all that stuff so it's just interesting whenever you peel back the curtain and it's like it's like people being shocked to see people who are impoverished or like oh that's right people really do live like that it's like or, open it's just like that's it's just like peeling back the curtain a little bit and um i think any time that there's an artist making awareness like that it's it's really good yeah and i mean it's that goes back to like willful ignorance whether we're using the example right. of you know, meat eaters not wanting to watch footage of how their meat, where it comes, you know, to right. me, that's just, if you're going to, if you're going to do X, then know about X. And if you yeah, still choose I mean, X, at least you're doing it from a place of like conscious choice versus like being willfully right. ignorant, which is to me, one of the most um, insidious things that uh, it's a disease but anyways I digress um yeah and people uh, like that whole like, ignorance is bliss is that expression that um has been around forever but yeah, yeah. and it's I, I think it is up into a point and then um at a certain point it becomes something that literally will rot you from the inside out without you knowing it right like I personally have always wanted to know everything about everything to make the best de decisions I can make personally like mm -hmm. how could you not want to know like where your products come from or your like about plastics you know all these things that are are hurting the environment now like how right. could you not want to know these things and I think these things are important to Bong Joon-ho and um that's why he's making films that talk about you know, global warming and about that, um, the one that touched on veganism and stuff like this. And um, it is, it is definitely like, uh, it's an entertaining film, but it also is like an, an expose in a way on, oh, well, these, on these topics, which is awesome. Absolutely. And I, to the, to the question or to the point that you just made, like, I've always been somebody that wants to know as much as possible about any given, about X, so that I can be more informed and make better decisions. I'm the same way. I think a lot of people would, would like to think of themselves the same way, but I would also um, retort. <laughs> I would rebuttal that with, that's also something that comes with having a certain level of comfort in life. 
and that speaks to class because you a have to have access to information which not everyone does class right you also have to have like enough uh, like your certain left certain um levels in your maslow's hierarchy of needs food shelter right. whatever warmth have to have been met in order for you to even concern yes. yourself with those things so if you're worried yeah, not about not only that but if if vegetables are more expensive than meat which low right. quality low extremely right. low quality meat then what are you gonna do? that's crazy like, again you, you didn't make good we don't make good choices some of us have good choices i i think that's like bible right. but I'm i've so also talked to people who you know we're not wealthy, but we're not, you know, poor either. But right. I've talked to, well, I've talked to kind of people in each of those areas. And mm -hmm. some of them I've talked to have said stuff like, oh, I know about that, but I just don't want to know about that because it'll just ruin things for me. Yeah. So yeah. there are people that are like that, unfortunately, not you and I, but yes, I agree. I can't, I can't stand that. And I can't, commiserate with or understand it either it's just like well why i mean why do you just i don't know there's just something innate in me that's like i want to know like i want to know i want to know Wait. about how food is produced how products are produced the effect like who i'm buying from because you know you vote with your dollars that kind of stuff yeah. i don't and know even wanting to do those things aside like if you are of of a certain level, if you are living in a certain level of comfort, let's just say right. you have food, shelter, your needs, home, met. your needs met, and you don't, you willfully avert your eyes from the shadowy goings on that afford you your comforts in life. Yeah. I because you're I afraid it's gonna rain on like your parade. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I think this would be really calls that out especially in those two juxtaposed scenes where she's pulling her shit out of her walk-in closet and the, the camera <laughs> is at the center. and yeah, also when he did that i was like yeah that's awesome and and the use of water in this movie because for yeah. water for the, the the park family and the people that are living on literal higher planes of society and water. metaphorical the water is a source of, you know, watering their gardens and right. blah, 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 blah. The, the blah, blah, vase, the extremely overpriced, like, vase, water bottles, or boss, about, I mean, B-O-S-S, -S, you know, the, the $4 uh, bottles of water that they people have in the that, fridge. People that keep Voss in their fridge are assholes. I'm just yes. telling you right now. Yeah, this is the club. <laughs> but water is destructive. <laughs> The rest of society, I mean, it floods the, the Kim family's right. house. Sewage, you know, is running through their home. Like yes. the, the life giving. And it all runs down. Water. Like, like the shit runs downhill. Shit rolls downhill, Literally. that expression. Literally. Yeah. In a class system, too, especially, it's so well illustrated here. So, um, yeah, the only other thing I want to want to mention is I want to kind of circle back to the stone, but I wanted to see if you had any other notes or if you wanted to talk about um, the conversations about odor. Um, I do. And I just I had a note that the birthday sequence got really complex really quickly. Like there was so much to process. Um, it wasn't just like like in some older films I've loved, especially from the 70s. There's usually a pivotal moment, like right at the end, that's shocking. And it's like one thing that happens. And you're like, you're left to like meditate on the shock of that one thing. This film is giving you so many things in that moment. This person's getting stabbed. That person had a, has a head injury. This person wants his keys. That person is like, and it's just like, you're processing it all as quick as you can, but like, you can't sub process. Like you're getting everything that's right. happening. But then the later same. you're thinking like you're thinking through this person's thought process, which is like a whole list laundry list of like right. they're realizing this now, like the the park dad is realizing that mm -hmm. there's like this family moment over here and he didn't even know they were family. And it's like right. there's so many different things to like take apart in that scene that you can't do in real time. 
And that's interesting. It, it kind of is like preventing you from like fully digesting that moment. And then you have this really nice um, epilogue, which we can talk about, which I really yeah. like both visually and just um, the plot of it. But the birthday scene, which is like the kind of climax of the film where the Kim family and the Park family and the couple living in the bunker are all forced to like, really just like- Collide. Collide, like yeah, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a collision literally. And it ends in um, the Kim daughter getting stabbed to death. It ends in the Park father dying, getting stabbed to death. It ends with the Kim son getting a head injury from the, the scholar stone, which is, I want to circle back to that. Um, the mom um, gets injured, but she gets away. Um, and does the, the the park mom die as well? I can't remember. Or does she get away as well? I think she gets away as well. Okay. But yeah, you have the, this like bloodbath in the yeah. in setting of a little boy's Native American themed, you know, uh, posh birthday party. It's it's right. again blood will be spilled of set and setting, you know, to illustrate yeah. class difference. Yeah, there's also, this great shot that's only like a split second long, but you see the blood like fly across the table with like the cake and everything. And it's so visceral. It's a gorgeous scene, but like, it's like real quick. And just everything's the quick at that moment. It's very quick. It's to your point, like you can't take it all in on the first viewing, but the fact that it's, you you have this subtext of Native American, you know, you literally have the dad dressed up with a headdress. There's a TV. Right. You have this like subtext of like Native American genocide. Like also one of the one of the ultimate examples of a culture being like just stamped on right. by another another like another group of people or class in a way of a different I, society, but. I was almost going to say it's fantastic, but I meant yeah. the scene, not Native American oh, genocide. <laughs> definitely. It is. I yeah. Need to be clear. I need to be clear on that one. Um, yeah. Uh, what else? What else? This, the smells, if you want to talk about the smells of the poor. <laughs> the smells of the poor. Um, yeah. When the you smell, they talk about the smell on a subway. They talk about the way that the father smells and only people that ride subways smell like that. And now yeah. that he's driving, it's, it's the park father that particularly notices it. And it's mm -hmm. almost like we can, it's like the rich saying we can smell the poor and yeah. it's, it's just offensive to us. It's almost like, I don't want to see how my, my meat is made in a way. Like, I don't, that I don't want to, I'm, I'm of the upper class. I don't want to smell the lower class. Right. You're e I, even I, to smell I, them. Yeah. I have lower class people employed, but I don't want to know how my meat is made. You're 100% right on that. And, mm. and the, the, the smell is offensive, but it's almost like the offense isn't really the odor. The, the odor is the, like the symptom they're they're offended by being uh, confronted with the other and right. like they're, that they are in opposition to um not in opposition to literally like um oppressing the pe these people and like that yeah. odor literally the smell because we know when you smell stuff there's actually like, to you right You're, right it's becoming part of you you're forced to reconcile what's really yeah. going on and they don't want to face the fact that they they live in a part of the society which is an oppressive part and works to keep it that way for the upper class and right. even though they're not directly like anti-low class people and oppressing them you know intentionally consciously on a day-to-day -day okay. level they're playing a part in a society that does yes yeah, yeah. So the, they're the, complicit that, in that sense it's heartbreaking because you uh, you, you know you see yeah. him hold those and then you the see way the way he does it and it's just so offensive to the kim father that the His final time he breaking. does it when he does that to the guy who comes out from the basement the yeah. um uh, the bunker that guy yeah you can imagine would smell really bad because he can't shower down there and he, he can't have hygiene down there as well. So 
plus he's like the 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 film's epitome of the low class within the film so um when he finally holds his nose at that guy at the end the kim father can't take it and just goes after him and stabs him yeah yeah, he finally is able to empathize uh, with somebody in his own circumstance. Right. Circumstance. But when it's and too late. Was, well, yeah, it's way too late because everybody's yeah, about to get so fun. it's almost like Bong yeah. saying, "Don't wait till it's too late to come right. together as you know to stand up for each other." And the most heartbreaking scene for me, where the smell theme was concerned, is when the park husband and wife are like fucking fondling each other in the most uncomfortable fashion possible on you know, the couch. And the yeah. husband and his two kids are hiding under the coffee table. Yeah. And they have to to <laughs> he's the really couch. going to town. Oh, he's really going to town. Um, Very explicit. And, oh, but the funniest thing when he's, like, he's rubbing her nipples and she's like, go counterclockwise. I lost yes. my shit. But like... I was like, what when, difference does that make? <laughs> no. When the kids are listening to him talk about his how their dad smells and they they're just laying there trapped and they the heartbreak is just so sad and the dad is like do I really smell and of of course he probably doesn't but it's just like I think it's a little metaphorical it's like they smell yeah. they smell in other ways other than literally smelling too right you know, no. they are um they are they live in a damn pleasant. Yeah, they it's, it's like they're camp. unpleasant across the board. Yeah, to the, the stuff supposed to smell. I don't know. I I just yeah, heartbreaking. I almost think um, it's like metaphorical, almost more than like literal. But literal. I mean, I so. it's I both. Know. But yeah. But it's meant. I think it's meant to. It's it's like it's metaphorical insofar as like they're having to confront the reality right. of with this. The, cavernous gap between them and the kim family yeah like when like they say oh i've smelt it like on the subway and the wife says the 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 park wife says god it's been forever since i've been on the subway it's been ages you know they don't have to run exactly they don't have to run in those circles and it's like oh you know that's so gross or whatever and they they just they have such a simplified um disgust of it that doesn't like transcend just such a basic like level where it's just like oh that's unpleasant but they have no like interest in those people as human beings None. yeah, yeah. well said interesting um, i going back to the the scholar's stone for a second which is a, a through piece throughout the film they carry it with them um it's eventually weaponized against the kim family when um Somebody, I forget if it's the husband or the wife in the bunker, use it to like force trauma. Like they hit the Kim son over the head. And he in the epilogue wakes up after coming to. I I when I first saw the movie, I was like, why didn't he die? That would have killed anybody. And of I course, know that's what I was thinking too at first. Um yeah. Reddit to the rescue. Reddit pointed out that the seen earlier in the movie where the Kim house floods there's a shot which I did not notice there's a shot of the scholar stone floating in the water which suggests that it's hollow and that's why he didn't die which is also an allegory for the fact that the stone was hollow the entire movie and was never going to give them material wealth because it was a hollow icon it didn't it didn't it wasn't a real idol I don't know about that I mean, don't you think that they held it with a lot of, that they had a lot of weight, like the way they handled it and stuff? And the way yeah. that they used it as, an, as, a, as a weapon suggested that it had a lot of weight to it. Weight. Yeah, I mean, I'll that's how- I'll have to go back and find the, where it's floating, but definitely it's yeah, floating that's interesting. In the apartment, which suggests that it was never like a true right. idol and it was never gonna really bring them anything, like any, Anything that they made happen, they made happen through their own doing. Um, I, I thought, yeah, happen. I found uh, I found so many videos on YouTube, and I it's fun to sift through and say like, well, these are all theories, and I wonder what is true of Bong Joon Ho's actual right. like um, intention, and what is just like 
because a film like this, it's so well done. There's so many layers to it that certainly are there that it's almost like you can then layer it even more another 10 steps and get away with it. But um, yeah. that definitely sounds plausible, though. I mean, didn't you even think of that. You can project a whole lot onto this movie, but I, I love yeah. how much... Which, which I think Bong would support in a way. I think so, too. I mean, art, yeah. art is supposed to challenge you and, and ask you to do that. It better. Um, you know, there's a line where the Kim son earlier on, or, or I think it might actually be in the epilogue, actually, when he comes to after being hit in the head and his sister's dead, his father's missing, his mom is, you know, okay. And he keeps, he says, the rock keeps clinging to me. And then you see him place it when he leaves the hospital in the river, right. suggesting that he's ready to like make his own way. Um, right. I, I thought that was fascinating. And then we see the epilogue. Do you want to talk about, a little bit about the epilogue? Yeah, I love the imagery in the epilogue. The film definitely slows down and meditates on stuff like snow and um, the characters being more still in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. And so it's, a, it's kind of, it's interesting. And then, of course, the son goes back to the house to look through binoculars and uh, notate a whole message from his father who has now assumed the role of the old man that used to be in the bunker. So right. the Kim father has now become that character, um, right. which is so interesting. A and, um, you know, of course would be arrested if he was out in public for right. some of the things that he did, including stabbing, you know, the, the, um, the park Perfect. husband. Yeah. And so he's kind of like hiding out in there, but he's also like further forced down by like society and everything. And right. it's just crazy. Um, and then what's so great is when the son says, well, I'm going to work my ass off. I'm going to buy that house. And when I buy that house, the only thing you have to do is walk up the stairs from the from the bunker from the basement because um that's true like once they own that house um he can essentially come out into the house and have and how does how live does he well think again his father's in the house because for a while nobody knows where daddy is so what right he's that's why i said he's looking through the binoculars and he gets the whole message from his dad the, the now him son did i don't know if i there's so many like characters that may I sometimes skip over the names too. No, but no, no, the, the no. Kim son, the Kim son um, goes back to the property when the Germans are living there now mm -hmm. after the fiasco of the birthday party where there's a bloodbath. And yeah. after he, you know, regains, you know, his life. And now it's the father who has this, his father. Um, the Kim father who has assumed that role and is now sending messages out the same way that the other guy was sending messages out. So it's like, uh, and it's, um, you know, a message to his son, but, um, or to his family. I forget most of the content of that message, but basically it's like, you know, I'm here, I'm hiding, I'm hiding right. here or whatever. And he, yeah. So, but at the very, very end, the final scene, it shows the son, the Kim son, purchasing or with the real estate agent to purchase that house. Right. Um, but it's not clear whether that is a real scene because there's narration going over it. And it's the Kim son narrating, I will do this, I will do this, I will become wealthy. Yes, I'll have a wife. Yes, I want a family. But the reason I'm doing all this is to purchase that house again so you can just walk up the stairs and not be imprisoned in that bunker. And it's showing you it, but it's not letting you know if it really happened or not. So in the I'm end, you don't you don't so know if it was possible. I'm so glad you mentioned that because I had did that actually happen or was it a dream question mark? Right. Like is, is it a happily ever after or is it like what the audience would like to have had happened? You know, a dad gets to come out of the bunker family gets to live in riches after all right I, i'm so glad you mentioned that i think i i think based on the fact that it's heavily narrated and, and 
it's up to the audience, like, because that would be a happy ending and it's more realistic that that wouldn't have happened. You know, maybe the son did better. Right. It is, it is more experience. realistic and depressing that it would be almost impossible for that to happen. It's like a one in a million chance yeah. um, for someone like that to make it out and, and to that level of well. Yeah, there was also just like something that I had occurred to me that I forgot to mention earlier, but there's a line, um, you know, we were talking about the smell and, and all of that, but in that, um, th there's a scene where the park father says to his wife that he doesn't like when the help crosses the line, and that's why they liked the maid, because she knew her place, and right. he literally says, I can't stand people who cross the line. And I realize that that's almost verbatim a line from Snowpiercer. There's a line in Snowpiercer of, oh, I yeah. think. yeah. Know your place. Yes. Yeah. Like, be a shoe. Like, don't cross the shoe. line. Yes. Um, know your place. Yeah. But I, I think the movie obviously is a masterpiece. I think it's a movie, like, even now having seen it three, four times, I could probably a few more times and still be enriched by it enriched by it what making it words but like you know it begs the ultimate question like who's the parasite you know like is it the Kim yeah. family is it, the, is it the people in the bunker is it all of us and when, Bong, of when Bong Joon Ho said in that interview that I sent you that the film should have been really called parasites because there were multiple and and there were those two families the one living uh, by conning the rich family and the one that kind of conned the rich family that live now subterranean. Right. And they're kind of mirrors of each other. And I thought about the movie Us and the movie Annihilation, other movies that show like a mirroring where things are mirrored, but they're not the same. You yeah. Know? And you notice in that mirror what is, what's mirrored, what's the same, but what's really not the same. Hmm. A fucking man. Yeah, I... Yeah. The movie forces you to, it forces you to ask the question, like, and, and ultimately, like, if we're all parasites, which I believe, I mean, it doesn't suggest, it, it tells us that um, everybody is complicit in keeping these systems in place. Right. You know, even well, those of us with the best of intentions, you know? Right, definitely. And you can't, it's the nature of being alive that you have to, to some degree, tread on the earth or tread right. on the environment or use on people to various degrees of choice and just um, convenience and need. I mean, we all, there's no way to, if we look at like how much waste we all make, it's crazy, but to some degree to live at all, you have to. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's just interesting to think of the different levels of that. It's We're interesting. all parasites on this earth, that's for sure. Yeah, and it's interesting. <laughs> answer. Yeah, no, and it, but it's interesting how, like, themes in pop culture all seem to, like, happen at this, like, start to manifest at the same time, like, across right. different platforms, television, film. Like, it's definitely a topic in, like, last right. week's episode of Westworld, like, literally that, like, we're maggots we're here yeah. literally just to speed up the death of the earth like and, and that things? that film us too is like and this film have a lot in common too about I, like subterranean I, people and all kinds of different things i really appreciate you bringing up us as as an, an uh as analogous to this because i wouldn't have thought of that but you're absolutely right and i think they came out around the same time i'm going to try to look that up Parasite's 2019, right? Or did it have an earlier release, maybe? Uh, I, it, I still think it would have been early 2019. I'm so oh. sure it's 2019. Yeah, it says 2019 for Parasite. Let me look up Us real quick. I think Us might have been 2018, but yeah. Us is 2019 as well. Oh, it is. Okay, so they yeah, both came out early then. Kind of illustrates your point about things kind of coalescing within culture at, at similar times and yeah not that they copied each other but like there's definitely themes and I've I've heard um stuff, a lot stuff of people is yeah 
yeah, like stuff is like crystallizing and catalyzing and coming up. Yeah, yeah not to get too metaphysical, but absolutely. Well, it is. I will, no, I mean, I, I, I know you, you're not like a huge fan of that. Um, yeah. Or you don't, you don't put stock in the, in, in the reality of those things, but, you know, stuff is, you know, when you see stuff like become part of the zeitgeist all at the same time across like different modalities and different mediums of like art and storytelling, clearly something is stirring in the collective unconscious and it's like right. coming up. Well, I believe, I believe it's like in the TV show Devs, which I'm watching now, thanks to you. I, I Yeah. Um, like I'm far enough in it now where they're saying that everything happens for a reason and everything is cause and effect. So I mean, even if you look at like the bubbling up of something, it's like, oh, this person is saying it and it's inspiring these three people who say it and that it inspires this big person and this other big person at the same time. And now they're both saying it. And it, I mean, there's a bubbling up effect um, yeah. culturally with a lot of yeah. this stuff, even with like expressions, um, phrases and you know, uh, social media, hashtags, all kinds of stuff. These things, you see all these mini trends now all the time. It's all the same thing. It's just, yeah, stuff is coming to the fore, um, but it needs to. And it's coming to the yeah. fore because it needs to. Like, stuff needs to get addressed. Right, right, like, me too and all that, which is finally having its, like, reckoning. Yeah. Yeah, not without its problems, but finally. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's for another right. video, though. <laughs> That's for another saga. Any final thoughts on Bong Joon-ho's Parasite? No, this is definitely one of my favorite films of his, along with um, Snowpiercer. Um, yes. So, no, I loved, I loved this film. And um, it's interesting how we both weren't expecting this type of film, like with as much humor as it has in it. We were both thinking of something a little edgier, like, in terms of being dark in yeah. tone. Um, that's just funny, because, yeah, I was like, but I, okay. I'm so grateful that it was funny, because that, to me, grounded it much more in reality for me, that in spite of the darkest of circumstances, like, having a sense of humor about your, not being self-serious, having a sense of humor is really the only thing that can help you get through the day. That was very realistic and grounding for me right. as far as this narrative is concerned. So, and also it just made for a great movie, so. Absolutely, definitely. Well, um, We should I have like have... a rating system where we, we give our stamp of approval. This one has, you know, our stamp of approval for sure. Uh -huh. How many Chad and Mel, how many Chad and Mel's out of five do we give it? <laughs> exactly. I, a five out of five. I'm going to give it five Chad and Mel's out of five too. Awesome. But then, but then Snowpiercer, I like better. So it's like. Snowpiercer, I'll, I'll do like a, a four and a half maybe out of five, but I know you're a five out of five on that one, which is just fine. Okay. But I'm like with Snowpiercer, I'm like a five out of five plus oh because it's like way up there it's way up there yeah all right so, so like an a plus a five out of yeah. five plus yeah i don't know i will have to work on our scoring system yeah but yeah we'll get our shit together one of these days <laughs> yeah well, hopefully um well we thank you guys as always for watching um we encourage you to watch snowpiercer if you haven't um, the Snowpiercer Chad and Mel Movie Hour will be coming out this Saturday, and we will follow, obviously, with Parasite, and then um, we will round it out with Bong Joon-ho's mother, and um, we encourage you to see that as well. So comment below, thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, um, give the video a thumbs up, obviously, like and subscribe. Um, Chad's music will always, always, always be linked in the description box, and um, I don't know. Uh, hashtag we are the virus has never been more relevant. Um, cheers. Uh, I guess we will see you on the other side. See you on the other side. <laughs>